There are those who question some of your very aggressive views on climate, yeah. saying it's understandable from a climate point of view. At the same time, you've got some problems with electricity and about power in the state of California. Do you need to make a trade-off? And are you willing to make that trade-off to give up a little bit of energy security in order to address the climate well, issues? Well, the energy security question, flip that upside and said, Texas, where they had more extreme problems, and that was based on their all fossil fuel plants and their aging infrastructure. And the fact, they're doubling down on that with natural gas and other fossil fuels. The reality is they had three days of blackouts. Uh, they had over $100 billion economic damage. Hundreds of people lost their lives. In 10x the gigawatt problems we had in California. We were distress test in the most extreme, had no blackouts. We were challenged, but we kept our wits and we're keeping our agenda and we're maintaining our policy principles that I think will allow us more resilience in the future. So no, I don't think you have to sacrifice one for the other. I would argue not transitioning is the bigger risk and the bigger sacrifice. Transitioning is an important word in that sentence. Yeah. Uh, it's not all of one or all the other, isn't it? Because a lot of experts say, yes, certainly, we have to get to renewables, but you can't just give up, for example, on natural gas, that that is actually part of the path for the transition. Do you agree with that? 100%. In fact, we were able to keep the lights on because we kept a lot of our once-through cooling plants online. We were able to do backup generators. We are not naive about the situational challenges, but. That doesn't mean we don't accelerate. I'll give you an example in areas like battery storage. We have the largest installed battery projects on planet Earth. It was 250 megawatts two and a half years ago, close to 4,000 megawatts today. It's our largest power plant today. That's just in two and a half years. Look at what we can do in five, 10, 15 years. So I think people are naively assuming we're not capable of doing so much more with the innovation and entrepreneurial spirit that finds the best of this country. Enormous growth in your battery capacity. You said where you could go. Where do you need to go in order to get to zero well, emissions? At, I mean, I, look, we have very ambitious goals to carbon neutrality, not net zero, carbon neutrality in 2045. We've established interim goals, 90% of clean energy on our electricity grid by 2035. And of course, we have the 2035 ZEV mandate, which is the most aggressive of any jurisdiction, certainly in the United States, one of the few in the world. So we have to do multiples, probably six gigawatts a year, uh, to move things along, and here's how we do it. It's not just putting unprecedented amount of money to back up these technologies and tax incentives, which we have, $54 billion of new incremental investments, setting the most aggressive policies to get the private sector to invest and fill the gaps, but also the biggest issue that we face is time to project deliver, not just from a supply chain perspective, but permitting perspective, the nimbyism, huge issue. And so we did something profound this year we have completely knocked out all of those barriers and we put in rigid timelines to get projects permitted and go through a judicial process if they're challenged. And that, we think, is a game changer. Anything I read about this says carbon capture is critical. And I know that's an important part of your strategy. Yeah. At the same time, have we really taken carbon capture to scale, uh, to the scale you need it to be, particularly out of the air? Yeah, not yet. We have direct air capture, a number of companies in California. In fact, they're demonstrating that in Wyoming as we speak. We worked with the oil industry. You'd never believe that since they just did a referendum uh, against our efforts uh, on our setbacks, health and safety setbacks. But no, carbon capture, sequestration, we want to invest in that. And by the way, that's an important point you're making. We were able to find some balance in that space. A few years ago, our environmental justice community, others were like, no, we don't want to have that conversation. Green hydrogen, didn't even want that conversation. So we've been accelerating on all fronts, recognizing we need to de-risk, including, by the way, extending the life of our nuclear plant for five years in order to stress test this grid as we transition and de-risk and look at the issue of cost, which is profoundly important. Uh, California, for years, has been on the cutting edge of vehicle emissions. Yep. Electric vehicles are going to be terribly important for all of us in this transition. At the same time, there's something called, I'm told, Proposition 13, about, uh, 30, 30, about a possible yeah. tax yeah. that would give some incentives. You're not in favor of that, No, I'm not for self-directed taxes. I don't think we need to be taxing anybody. We just had a $101.4 billion operating surplus. I'll repeat that. No federal money. California enjoyed a $101.4 billion operating surplus, 7.8% GDP growth last year. You look at what we're doing in terms of economic growth and development, it belies everything Elon Musk or someone like that is saying, or what you're seeing in your nightly news. California's resilience, our strengths, demonstrable. That said, I don't think we should be taxing people anymore at this moment, and then directing that tax to solve a problem where California has been a leader, and that's in the ZEV space, where I put $10 billion in the budget, the legislature approved it, 
and this purports to solve for that when in fact we're already doing it. Climate is without question a very large problem in this country and the world right now. Another very large problem in this country is immigration yep. or migration. And we're seeing a group of people, particularly asylum seekers, essentially getting shuttled around the country, yep. almost like footballs. What is the right solution to that? Because it's, it's not good for the people right now. It's the incapacity for politicians to get out of their own way, both parties. I cannot stand Ron DeSantis and these folks that are using these human beings, children, as political pawns, disgust me. The cruelty of that is self-evident to any person that truly cares and has compassion. That said, the issue is real. I'm a border state governor. Mm -hmm. You don't need to lecture me on this topic. Uh, the reality is lived every single day. We need comprehensive immigration reform. And the irony of this, the frustration I have, is Joe Biden put out a great plan. He has a plan, eight-year pathway to citizenship, fast-tracking dreamers and TPS, dealing with border security and new technology. Yes, dealing with the underlying issues, but also dealing with the backlog of asylum seekers and court processing and looking at high skill, not just low skill jobs. But we're not talking about it, not promoting it. And Republicans consistently from 2007, 13 have blocked any conference reform, shame on them. Would that plan give us a secure border? Because most people agree to have a country, you need to have a secure border. I believe in that. I believe in border security. I believe in a pathway, though, to citizens dealing with reality. Ronald Reagan believed in that. Last comprehensive reform in 1986. Of course, Ronald Reagan was a leader in the low carbon green growth space. So was Richard Nixon. What the hell's happened to the Republican Party? Ronald Reagan said some of the most deeply thoughtful and I think spiritual things anyone's ever said about immigration. What the hell's happened to the Republican Party that are othering in these poor victims that are legally seeking asylum and then calling them aliens? and using them as pawns. I mean, it's really it's just a disgrace, but I get it because we haven't owned up as a country in the past, today, and it doesn't even appear tomorrow. There's a willingness to have the conversation. We need to have comprehensive immigration reform. Joe Biden submitted a plan, it's in writing, that is a great starter to, yes, secure our border and address the reality. And by the way, I'll close on this, the reality that's very well understood in California from Silicon Valley to the Central Valley. No state has more to lose if we do not advance comprehensive reform. Immigrants have helped build our economy as the fifth largest in the world. And no state in the union is more important, economically and all sorts of different ways. You're dealing with some very big issues. That some, some of them have to be dealt with at the federal level. Uh, we have Joe Biden in the White House. He's a Democrat, you're a Democrat, I know you're loyal to him. Yes. At the same time, I wonder for somebody like you, how do you make sure there's a bench? There's a, the next generation coming along that may even include a Gavin Newsom. Not to push him out, because I know you wouldn't want to do that, but how do you make sure, because you're going to need the next generation? We have amazing, I, I've been very involved in the Democratic Governors Association, been supporting candidates, Josh Shapiro, what a rock star. Wes Moore, Wes Moore, watch him. We've got a bench, we've got some remarkable young leaders, and not even a time of life, a state of mind. Doesn't even matter how old you are. Bobby Kennedy said that. What the world needs are the qualities of youth not a time of life, a state of mind. So we have a bench. We just need them to get out and be supported, embraced, and we need them to have the back of our president.